So for the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about cryptography. I'm going to be spending some time both looking at what might be called best practices and also exploring what can be done when we use beyond the standard recipes into more uh, interesting domains. You want to advance on? So firstly, a little bit of information about me. Um, I am, a, I am a biochemist by training. Most of my work is done in data analysis. I am not a cryptographer by training. It's really just my interest in security that has brought me here. And I hope, I hope that some of the knowledge I've picked up over the past few years is going to be of interest to you as well. So going back, my first real sign of interest in this was probably in 2010 when I was more a PHP person and working with uh, Zen's framework and I added the bcrypt um, method of, pass of password hashing to the authentication module. So we'll talk a little, a little bit about that later on. But we're going to start off with a bit of an overview first. So we'll talk about symmetric key encryption. We'll talk about public key encryption. And we'll also look at key derivation, which is going to go back to that bcrypt. And then we'll look at a couple of examples where we try to tackle authentication in two different ways. The first one will be two-factor, which I would really consider the gold standard. And then I will also try to address how we can implement a partial password scheme in a way that it isn't absolutely terrible. Okay, so encryption. We have a message. We want to be able to pass it to someone else without anyone intercepting and understand what we are saying. So we want to modify that message in such a way that, it, it, that its meaning can be recovered, but it is exceptionally difficult to do so if we move on, uh, I think if you want to go back and then down. Okay, so symmetric um, encryption. When we're talking about symmetric encryption, we're talking about having the same key used for both the encryption side of things and the decryption side of things. So this works quite nicely. It's quite a simple approach, but it does have that limitation that you need to have the key everywhere that message is going to be read ahead of time. So it makes it quite difficult if you have to send a message over a currently unsecured pathway. So we're going to go back to, I guess, close to the beginning of encryption going back to the first century BCE, when Julius Caesar had a need to communicate without his communications being spied on. And he came up with this very simple, what we now call the Caesar cipher. And all we do for this is, given a letter from our message, we shift it back or forward in, in, the, alphabet, in, the, in the alphabet alphabet by a certain number of characters. So in this instance, we have the letter E in our plain text at the top here. And when we convert it to our cipher text, the private version, it becomes a B. So this works quite nicely in that the key is very simple. It can be decrypted directly with the key and it can be decrypted quite easily if you have the key. It, it, you have to go through it letter by letter, but it's not that much work. The trouble is, even without the key, there are only so many different ways you can, const you can construct this cipher. So you only really need to decrypt the message 26 times and you know what the real message is. So this was conclusively identified as being a, vul as being a vulnerable cipher as early as the 19th century by, a, I guess, one of the first uh, um, crypto, crypto analyst um, named Al Kindi. So there was a need for a more um, tougher, um, a stronger um, cipher to use. So next along was the Vignier, which I maybe um, 
mispronouncing. And this took the approach of still working from the Caesar cipher, but instead of just using one Caesar cipher, it would use multiple Caesar ciphers. It would take a keyword as the secret, it would repeat that keyword for however long your message is, and then each letter would be associated with a particular cipher. So you go from having one cipher to work from to having multiple. So this was developed in 1553, and by 1854, it was um, defeated by Babbage, and he had written reports on how it could be defeated. It sounded like it was a fairly known vulnerability by that point, but certainly by 1854, it was known to be um, susceptible. So we're taking that single Caesar cipher, which we know is very susceptible to frequency analysis. We are increasing it, but we still have a fairly limited set. So it's still susceptible to that frequency analysis. However, there is one possibility where we can take this to a point where it just becomes invulnerable to, ta to that type of um, to that type of of analysis, and that is if we use a keyword, a secret that is as long as the message we want to encrypt. That way, we're using a different cipher for every single character. So we essentially end up with what is a one-time pad, and this is essentially as secure as you can get. So this takes us up to World War One, World War Two, and we're looking at rotor machines. So you could have a secret that is as long as your message, but that's really impractical. If you have to send, your, send a piece of text that is as long as your message in a secure channel, you may as well just send your message. So rotors take the approach of expanding a very small secret, the position of the rotors, and expanding that to a much larger secret that can be used to construct that sequence of uh, ciphers. So if you press the button, it will advance the rotor once, you'll get a different cipher again and so on. So if you have one rotor, you're looking at 26 possible, cipher, possible ciphers. And then if you take that up to two and three, as the first one rotates a full, re rotates a full revolution, the next one moves one position and so on. So with three rotors, you can get up to a message length of 17,500 characters without any repetition. So that's obviously much more secure to frequency, frequency analysis. So now we are moving on to today, the current technology. So this is AES. This is now a block cipher, so we are encrypting um, individual blocks and chaining these together as we need for longer messages. We aren't just applying that linear letter-to-letter -letter, um, change now. We are applying multiple substitutions and permutations, both linear and non and non-linear. And we are at the point now where really, if this is going to fail, it is going to fail through some sort of mistake in the implementation. The underlying um, structure is secure enough that it's not really a concern. But there are some potential issues, the first of which is tampering, and the second of which is those implementation issues which can cause problems. So the main one is the mode of operation. So, oh, I think, yeah, we go down again. So the mode of operation, oh, sorry, if we talk about the tampering first, so by tampering, what I mean is, I think something that Alan touched on with the JWT tokens, we need some sort of verification that the message hasn't been altered. And just in the generic form, there is no um, mechanism for that with AES. For the mode of operation, we have our inputs, which are the plain text and the key we are working with. And we have our output, which is the ciphertext. And the mode of operation is how we handle messages that span more than one block. So with ECB electronic codebook, this is the <coughs> simplest implementation, but it is also vulnerable. And the reason for this is we are simply applying our encryption function to the plain text and the key. So if you have two um, sections of your message that are the same, 
you'll be getting the same block out on the, on the encrypted side. So the way to solve this is CBC, which is, um, I think it's chained block cipher. And this works by applying the encryption to one block and then using the ciphertext from that as an input to the encryption to the next block. Okay, so if we go right. <coughs> so this takes us on to the cryptography package, which has really established itself as the go-to package for cryptography within Python. It breaks um, itself down into multiple sections. The main ones are the recipes, and these are the recommended best practices for various different tasks. And then they put everything else, the primitives that are used in what they call the hazardous materials. So if we're looking at the symmetric um, encryption, we're using the Fernet um, recipe for this. And it takes the basic um, approach of AES. It uses the CBC mode. Um, it's working with a 128-bit key. Um, and then to handle the tampering, which is an issue, it uses a hash message, uh, message, uh, message authentication code, which is a SHA-256 um, hash of the message. And the other potential issue is in CBC mode, we need to have a ciphertext for that first block of text we, we are encrypting. So this is known as the initialization vector. And in the case of Fernet, this is pulled from the urandom function of the OS package. So this is what the code looks like. It's really quite short. And this is the whole point of the cryptography package. It's making what could be quite a complex task into a very straightforward, there's no real way to mess this up. So we are importing Fernet, we are generating a key, we pass it to the Fernet um, object as we instantiate it. We get back this um, object which I have called F, and then using the encrypt method, we pass in the text we want to keep secret. We get back a binary um, um, sequence and then if we want to decrypt this either later on or after it's been transferred to someone else we pass it to the decrypt method and we can get our secret text back so this is very simple very straightforward it just works uh, I'm not sure if there was more oh, oh no you're good yeah okay so um, we have this generate key method that generates a key, but this is what it generates. And there is a prize if anyone can memorize this before it moves up the screen. So this isn't a practical uh, keyword um, password. So what can we do instead? Um, Within um, the cryptography package, there is options for key derivation. Unfortunately, there isn't a recipe for this. You do have to dive into those primitives, but it is possible. And key derivation allows us to take a password or a passphrase that is easy to remember and convert it into the format that we need for the encryption process. So we have a few different options. PB, KDF2 is probably one of the simplest, um, and that's what we will be using for here. The other three here have the same um, process they go through, but they're used in a slightly different way, and we'll look at that later. They are used more for um, situations where you are storing a password. And the uh, reason for these being different is if we are generating a key to encrypt a message, if that key is lost, message is already compromised. There's not, no real way of protecting that. If you are using a key derivation to protect a password within a database, 
you could potentially lose that database without having the security of your, of your application completely ruined. And these last three options allow you to have that small window of grace where, yes, the key has been lost, but the person needs to go from the key back to the password, and that takes a lot of computation power. And these three make that many, many times worse. So they can be optimized to um, require as much computation as you need for your security. So to generate our key from a password, because there's not a defined recipe for this, it takes a bit more work. There are more packages to input. We have our um, function here that will take in um, our take the settings we need. So in this case, we're use, using SHA-256 to hash the password. We want a key out at the end of 32. We need to generate a salt that needs to be saved as, along with the um, encrypted message, message. And we are going to um, run SHA-256 100,000 times over our password to get our key. We then call the derive method on whatever your password is, and we get out essentially what can be passed into the encryption. To make life a little bit easier, the cryptography package, package works with basics for um, encoding to um, feed into the um, Fernet uh, recipe. Okay, so moving on from symmetric key encryption to public key or asymmetric key encryption. And the difference here is that now we don't have the key, the same key for both processes. We use a different key for the encryption and for the decryption or the signing and the verification of the um, signing. So we have that different key. And because we have that different key, we can share one widely. We can post it, post it in an ad in the newspaper. We can announce it on the radio. It really doesn't matter. Everyone can have that, including whatever nefarious character you are afraid will decrypt your message. As long as they don't have the decryption key, they can't decrypt the message. So the key points here is that there's no shared key with these two separate ones, and this is useful for establishing that secured connection. So it's often used for securing websites with HTTPS, TLS, um, or SSH connections. This is the underlying technology that makes these um, things possible. So in the cryptography package, there isn't a recipe for this side of things. And I think that's largely because you have to wonder whether within your piece of software is really the right place to handle this. Often, elsewhere makes more sense. So in terms of HTTPS for a website, it may make more sense for the web server itself to handle that rather than your application. If you do want to programmatically use SSH, there is a package called, called Paramico. Within cryptography package, the um, tooling available in terms of recipes is this X509 certificate handling. So we can have a key that is public, it's shared around, so there needs to be some way of handling that, and this is the standard by which that, that happens. So everything else in terms of asymmetric, asymmetric en encryption is in hazardous materials. So I'll show a little bit of code. Uh, so firstly, public key encryption allows us not only to encrypt and decrypt a message, but we can also sign a message and verify a um, signature. So this allows me to say that I have written a certain thing and someone else could come along and verify that is the case. So, we, yeah, you're fine. No, no, you, okay, go down. So this is the code for generating a public-private key pair. 
Again, we are importing uh, the default backend. We are going into the hazardous materials and the primitives, pulling from asymmetric RSA. We are setting it up with the variables we need. So the public exponent is, this seems to be the default used everywhere. And then the key size, this can be adjusted the longer the key is, the more secure it, it is. 1048 seems to be reasonable at the moment. So once we have the key, then we can use that to sign a message. So if we go down. So we have our message here. We are setting up the padding we are using for that message. And this is all on the private key object we are working with. We are specifying the hash we want, want to use. And at the end of that, we will have our signature. The other side of that is taking that signature and verifying that it is correct, that the message has not been altered. So we first need to um, get the public key from our private key. And this is just using the public key method. We then go through the same process. We are passing in you now both our signature and the message. We are setting up the padding the same using the same hashing method. And at the end of it, if everything is correct, nothing will happen. If something isn't correct, if the message has been altered, then we will get a invalid, sign invalid signature exception and, uh, and we are able to handle that within our code. So I want to give you some practical advice for working with asymmetric key encryption. So if we look at the idea of securing a website, the first thing we can do that is easier today than it really ever has been before is to get a certificate and, a and enable HTTPS. So I've included a link here to Let's Encrypt. One of the issues with um, all this is that there are a multitude of different parameters and options and various different methods that can be supported. So it's easy to have this enabled, but still have various weaknesses. So there is a website called SSL Labs that will take in a URL and run it through multiple various checks and essentially give you a score and opportunities for improvement to go forward. So that's well worth doing. The other thing that I have linked up here is, is strict transport security. And this is useful if you're potentially in a situation where you have a website where people visit frequently or you go to a go to a website that you go frequently, but you're potentially going to visit it on a network that you don't necessarily trust. So you can set up a website to say you will always, or you should always expect a encrypted version of this site to exist. So if someone goes to that site in the future over a suspect network and they are pushed towards a non-encrypted version, it should create an error message and um, at least you know there is an issue there. So three different things you can do with increasing levels of security. So we've looked at a couple of different options for encryption, symmetric key and uh, public key encryption. I want to look at a couple of areas where we can apply encryption and I'm specifically going to look at authentication. So fortunately, authentication, although there have been issues for quite some time with systems being less secure than they should, this does seem to be an area where things are getting better. So the simplest way of handling authentication, assuming you're just using a username and a password, is to just store both of those in a database on the back end. A user comes to your website, submits both pieces of text. 
you check them against the database, and if they match, you know they are who they claim to be. But if someone is able to get access to that database, then they can um, impersonate any one of your users with no additional work. So we can improve on that basic approach by hashing the password in the database. That increases the amount of work that's needed, but it's very quick to hash tens of thousands, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of passwords, store them in a table, and can quickly just do the reverse lookup. So a way to make that a little bit more difficult is to use a salted hash. So this is adding a random string to the password and then hashing that. You store the random string. When a user comes back again, you just add them together, hash, and check. But with things like um, using GPUs for general processing type tasks, even with a salted hash, it's very quick to just run through the top 100 million passwords and make that reverse lookup. So we need some way of slowing that process down. We want it to take a very long time to compute 100 million hashes. So key derivation is really where this fits in, and we're looking at those methods of bcrypt, sscript, and argon2. But we can move beyond just simple username password combination, and we can look at having two different factors for authentication. One is usually the password, and then the other may be something you own. So a classic example is SMS. You have your phone. The website sends you a message, and then you enter a code from that. A limitation there, though, is there is no guarantee that that message won't be seen by someone else. There are vulnerabilities on that side of things that can create issues. So really, I think the gold standard at the moment is second factor authentication, but where the device that message is being sent from is, is authenticated. So in terms of second factor, we have SMS, which is better than nothing, a lot better than nothing, but it still has some weaknesses. We could also handle this using push, using push notifications to a phone or some other device. We have biometrics, and then we have things like um, hash-based and time-based one-time passwords. So a user may come to a site, they'll enter the email and a password, they'll pass press sign in, a message will be sent to the phone and they will get a screen like this where they have to enter in the code to progress any further. Some sites have this kind of hybrid approach where they will have the SMS um, second factor, factor but they have the option for a more secure version as well. So in this case this is GitHub where I have my phone registered with them but I also have a second factor token registered with them. So I can either enter the code or I can um, plug in my um, second factor token, press the button, and then progress that way. So this is an example of one of the tokens for what is um, called FIDO U2F. This is universal second factor. And this seems to be where uh, things are going in terms of the best way of handling this second factor. So I've written a blog post and released some code on this, and we'll just walk through it here. These are the specs and the website um, for the project. So what's going on under the hood with this? <coughs> so it's using public key encryption. It's doing what's called origin binding, that means we can have the same token for a website without any other website knowing it's seeing the same token. We also have the ability to support an unlimited number of services. If you're paying $10 for this token, you don't want it to run out after the first 10 websites. You want to be able to handle many more than that. And touching on the same idea as the origin binding here, 
There are no secrets shared between websites, so it's not possible for someone to track you from one website to another. <coughs> so going through the process as you register, we are firstly minting an origin-specific um, public-private keeper. The device stores the private key and references it to a key handle. It then sends the public key and the key handle back to the origin, the website. Then when you return to the website to authenticate, the origin sends the key handle that is associated with it. The private key is retrieved on the, on the device to sign a message, and then that is sent back to the, the origin. This all works fine, but if you want to support an unlimited number of devices, you need an unlimited database size for those, those keys. So instead, the private key is encrypted within the key handle. So that's stored on the website in question. So it's quite a nice way of being able to handle a very large number of websites and just, hand, and just push off that storage to somewhere else because it's encrypted and it is authenticated, there's no way it can be tampered with on the website in question. So you have that nice security as well as the cheaper option rather than storing it, storing it on the device itself. So this is widely supported, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. I think Google was the main partner with Yubico in terms of developing this approach. So obviously they support it, but it's widely supported at this point as well. So moving on to code, we're just going to implement a very simple Flask application. The tasks are going to be adding a new token when a user registers, selecting which token to use when a user comes to authenticate. Remember, this, this token only works if it's required to log in. And if you only have one and it breaks, then potentially you can no longer log in. So it's useful to have two tokens just in case one breaks, you can still log into any service you care about. So we select which token we want to work with. And we need to specify that because remember the key handle that the website has is where we are storing the private key. So if we pass back the wrong one, nothing's going to work. We authenticate, and in terms of what we store in the database, we're going to store everything in just a simple text field under device, and then we store a name and the data added just for the convenience of the user. If we have multiple devices, they're going to know, want to know which one they are working with. So in terms of the front end for adding a new token, we just have a very simple form. We have a hidden field, which is going to be the um, output from our token. And we have a name, which is going to be for the user's convenience. Most of the work is handled using JavaScript on the front end. So this is existing code. We just pass in our app ID, which is essentially our, U our U URL our version and the challenge, which is what we are going to sign. As we go to the website, a notification will flash up, flash up asking us to press the button on the token. It will then populate the response field and then submit the form back to the website. So I think I've already spoken about this, so I think we can just move on. So when we go to authenticate in terms of the uh, Flask code, we are firstly, firstly going to pull in the, the device we need from the backend, da backend database. We are going to call this begin authentication method, passing in our, our URL for the website and the device we are working with. We add um, the message we're signing to the session. And then we set up various uh, variables and pass these to the front end. 
So this is the JavaScript on the front end. The website is exactly the same again. We have a response field and then we are just going to submit and going to submit it. So we pass in our different variables. We call the sign method on the U2F object. Then when they press the button, this is submitted to the website backend. We then validate that the form is correct. It is validating. We check that we are not getting an error code back from the token. It is also checking that the everything is correct on that side of things in terms of is it getting a correct key handle. So we move on. We then handle the code on the back end to verify that the authentication is correct. So we complete the authentication step passing in the form response data. If we get um, any value other than one for that final variable t, we know it is an error and we um, call that out. If not, then we can go on and um, log in the user. So that's really what I would consider the gold standard at the present time. However, as I was going through this, I was logging into one of the uh, websites I belong to. I think this is a financial, fir financial services uh, firm. And this is the login they are using. So they ask for the account number, they ask for the date of birth, which clearly is in no way secret. And then the next screen has this. So we aren't looking for an entire password here. We're just looking for three different characters from the password. So this seems a bit odd in that it's kind of like having a three letter long password, which doesn't seem terribly secure. So why would we want to do something like this? I think it fills kind of the same need as that second factor of authentication. If you are on a suspect network or you're using a, a computer that doesn't belong to you, you probably don't want to be entering your complete password, everything you need to log into a site, as maybe there's a key logger on there or there's some other issue. So at least here, okay, an attacker may get three characters from your password, but they're not going to get the entire password, and the next time you log in, it may ask for different characters. So there's a little bit of security on the front end there. But this got me wondering, how is it implemented on the back end? We need to take a variable combination of letters from the user and somehow validate those against the complete password. So again, a blog post and code for this. So what are the options we could work for? Well, we couldn't just do the plain text version. That's obviously the simplest version, and I strongly submit that's what's most commonly done. But there are potentially ways we could do it better. So we could hash each character just as we would with a password. It's just a one character password. But there's only so many different options you can have if you have a one character password. You're essentially working with 26 of its um, letters. So we want to extend the length of that password. So we could look at every combination of three characters from the password and hash those. It gives us a bit more security. Now we have to look for 26 times 26 times 26. So those 15,000 or so passwords for the initial three characters. But every other character is just another 26 guesses. So it's a little bit more secure, but it's still fairly weak. So uh, the other issue with that is we have to saw a ridiculous number of hashes. If we're looking at every possible combination of three characters, that's a lot of potentials. So the other way we can go with this is what's called secret sharing. We take our password and we break it up into chunks such that a subset of those chunks can be recombined to recover the intact password. So this is going to save a lot of space. It's still vulnerable after you get those first three letters, but it seems to be the best backend possible for this kind of weak uh, task. 
So I implemented this with what's called Shamir uh, secret sharing. And again, we're taking our secret, our password, and we're breaking it up into multiple chunks such that a subset can be used to um, recover the um, intact password. So just as an example of this, if we have one point from our password, one of these chunks, we can plot it on a graph and we can potentially draw a unlimited number of lines through that point. So if we have a chart of the farm y equals mx plus c, we're going to need more than one point to recover those parameters, or for instance, the value of y when x is zero. So in this case, we would need two points, and if we had something with, say, x squared plus x plus c, then we would need three points, and so on and so forth. So you can generate as many points as you want, which are your partial chunks, and you know exactly how many parts of that you need to recover the intact secret. So this is altered slightly to make it a bit more secure by working on a finite field. So you could imagine if you had multiple points here, the area around here is probably going to be more likely than the area up here or way down here. So working on finite fields just makes it um, so that's no longer the case. It can fill essentially the entire range. So the code for this is widely available. It's um, on um, both in Python and, and actually the code is also on Wikipedia in Python as well, which is quite nice. We um, start off with this make random shares, specifying the minimum number of chunks we need and the total number of chunks we want to create. So in this case, we can recover the secret with just three chunks and we'll create eight in total. This creates very long numbers. Should we? Yep. So our secret here is this very long number and then we have multiple um, chunks for the um, shares. So this is going to be the core of our implementation but just as we saw with the key for the symmetric key en um, encryption, no one wants to have to, rem have to remember one of these ludicrously long numbers. That's just not a practical um, password, especially when we want to get to this point from a single character. Um, so just verifying that this works, we can take a subset of the shares, pass it into recover secrets and get our secret back out. So the way we're going to make this work is when we initialize, um, we are going to take each of the characters from our password, derive a key from each. We're going to generate the random secret and the shares. Then we encrypt each share with the key from the character um, that matches with it. We also want to apply key derivation to the secret at the end. We want to make sure that it's only at the very end that we know whether we, we have the right three characters or not. Then when we validate, we go through the key, go through the key derivation again, we decrypt the shares, recover the secret, apply key derivation again, check, and if it matches, we know the user is, user is good and they can progress. So I mentioned there was options for this of bcrypt, sCrypt, and argon2. I have used bcrypt for a good long while, so I'm using this here. It allows us to um, increase the work function quite, quite dramatically, so it takes a lot of work to um, go from the password to the key. But sCrypt, um, implement some additional um, safeguards here where not only does it increase the computation that's required, but also the amount of memory that is required. So it makes it a bit more uh, robust to things like dedicated um, um, things like GPUs and uh, ASICs and so on. 
But we're using bcrypt here. We get our key from the password. We then go on. And we can use the symmetric key encryption again. Since we've seen this before, we instantiate the phone to object, uh, encrypt, we get our message, we can decrypt, get back the secret. So we apply that here to our message. So what we've done here is we have changed the password. This is essentially what we would see if a bad actor comes to the website and tries to guess the password or if someone has the database and they are checking for multiple um, options, we are getting this invalid signature. So this essentially goes back to the idea of hashing the individual characters. It only means, it means we only have 26 options before we have compromised that letter. So this isn't going to work. The, message authentication that's built into the into this recipe for this particular use case is actually a detriment to what we're trying to do we don't want to know if we have the right message or not until the very end of this process so we can't use the phone net recipe from cryptography so we have to look at the primitives have to dive into the hazard, hazardous materials uh, so I think we've covered this, so we move on. So this is the warning that is flashed up whenever you go to the documentation within cryptography for these primitives. Essentially, uh, you may not want to proceed. Although, dinosaurs with laser guns, who wouldn't want to see that? But it's a bit more difficult to work with. So, we're going into hazardous materials, primitives, ciphers, um, pulling out the various things we need. We are working with that partial secret. So we have to package this up, encrypt it, um, have to convert the integer to uh, bytes. But at the end, we have our encrypted message that is not authenticated. So we go on. So then when we attempt to decrypt this, if we have the correct key, we get our number. If we have an incorrect key, we get something that is entirely plausible. This could be the correct um, output. So there's no way of knowing if we've got this character right or not at this stage. So we can proceed with the values. We recover the secret. We perform our key derivation and we compare. And because we are at this, the very end point here, we know we have to go through every combination of characters before we can get the right one. So the work must continue to, must continue to, to the end. We can't um, guess the characters individually. So we have done key derivation here for each individual character and for that final secret at the end. And because that final step is the most important, that's the one where we want to make the computational cost the highest possible. It doesn't really matter too much for the individual characters, but for this one, it really needs to be as high as we can bear. Did we go on? Okay, so to compare, so to conclude, in terms of using cryptography or encryption, the first question is probably, is this the right place to do this? Are there better ways of implement, implementing this outside of my code? The next is, are there dedicated packages? So for the uh, FIDO U2F authentication, there's a dedicated package for that, both for the Python side of things and also the JavaScript. There's really no reason to implement that from scratch. So if that's not possible, then we're moving on to the cryptography package and looking at those established recipes. And hopefully something will work. If not, then there's still options to progress, but we need to be a little bit careful. But remember, 
if it's a choice between no security and some security, it's probably better to um, uh, try. So in terms of the recipes, public key and symmetric are go to the cryptography, cryptography package. For key derivation, uh, bcrypt is certainly around for the longest. Scrypt was adding in that memory factor. Argon2 is very similar to Scrypt, but it's gone through a process of uh, public competition. And essentially, this was the um, version that was chosen to be the best. So I would certainly recommend that for going forwards. And yes, um, it certainly is possible to make mistakes. You need to be careful, but often a little bit of security is better than no security at all. So with that, thank you very much. I don't think it is, no. Are any, is there anything you mentioned? Uh, I don't think Bcrypt, Descrypt are Argon 2 are. Um, you can certainly get something cobbled together in terms of like 100,000 runs through um, um, SHA, uh, um, um, uh, SHA 256 is certainly better than nothing. So there are options that are. Um, as far as I know, the, if you want the best that is available, I don't think it's made it to the standard library, library yet. So I understand, you know, we don't want to be reinventing the wheel or building our own packages, but last year there was a popular, you know, Python package that got compromised with the developer or somebody that impersonated the developer on GitHub that added the backdoor. So. How do you see, you know, from an implementation standpoint, what can be done? Is it about, you know, checking every single, you know, commit that you will see on GitHub to see whether it's actually, you know, damaging or tainting your package, or are you putting some blind trust into somebody that's going to the default? I think it really needs to depend on what level of security you need. Um, so it's really going to be. Um, a question of does it make sense to go through and validate that every package you're using is clean. Um, but obviously that is a significant amount of work and not, not everyone is going to do that. Um, the other way of addressing that somewhat is probably to pick a version of the package you are interested in and stick to that and not follow every single um, um, uh, every single oh, every single new version so yeah um, when uh, you were at the end of the process of the symmetric keys where you're doing transformation uh, uh, you know the password yep. into a key you had an it indicated an application of uh, SHA-256 10,000 times why would you do that so, I mean, I know yeah. 10,000 is better than two, or is it? Is it just hitting the nail too many times after it's already in? So um, for, that particular, for that particular case, I'm not sure what the rationale, rationale is in terms of how much work you need to do. Mm. Um, in the case of like storing a password, there are very clear reasons that you, ha you want to have to do a lot of work. Okay. Um, for the encryption key, I don't think it's quite as sensitive to doing a lot of work, but you certainly want to make sure that there's no possible way of a weakness going from the password to the key or back, sir. So it's strictly just making it more compute intensive? Certainly in terms of um, handling um, passwords and storing that. For, for the encryption, I am a, I, I am a bit vague on exactly where the line okay, lies. Okay. Thank you. Is that about the public key? So the question was about the key was about the key was about the key derivation for um, taking a password to using the to using symmetric key encryption. Great talk, by the way. Thank you.
Thank you. Is, um, is there a way we can get your slides? So I will put all of the slides um, on the Meetup group um, and the links to all the, um, um, there, are blog, there, are a, there is a blog post on both the um, two-factor and the partial passwords and the links are in here as well. So I'll, yeah. Okay, thank you very much.